Hello everybody, um, my name is Leisha and if you guys don't know me, I recently had a rough couple of months and I'm not even sure how to do this. This is like my first video ever and I'm only doing this because so many people have asked for the story and I'm at a point where I would like, I would, I would like to not have to repeat this story over and over again so that if anybody ever asks me a question about it up to this I can always just refer them back to this video um, so yeah my name is Leisha and to everybody who knows me I'm gonna be talking in English in this video only because I want as many people to be able to understand this and I want people to be able to like if somebody needs a story like this or if somebody is going through something similar at least they can refer to this video or like I don't know like my experience um, this is not like I'm not a medical professional by any means um, <laughs> what happened to my daughter really came out of the blue for us and it really took us by surprise so I'm gonna try my best because I think like part of my brain has stopped <laughs> or like has compartmentalized a lot of what happened and sometimes it's a bit harder for me to get the information yeah, um, yeah. so <laughs> I'm trying my best here but I guess I'll just start from the beginning so I got pregnant Deepavali well I found out I was pregnant Deepavali 2020 and I was happy like ecstatic was I planning for it no I was not planning for it I actually my husband and I planned to get pregnant uh, 2021 and then we thought like okay uh, like now that we know we want to have kids like maybe let's build towards a life that we would like to have when we want kids and then i got pregnant <laughs> so when i found out i got pregnant though we were very happy we were very excited um i didn't tell anyone not even my sisters like i only told one sister yana my younger sister and i told her because like i tell her everything and i before i even told anyone i went to see my gynecologist and she confirmed it and I was like okay now we can go around telling people but obviously I kept it to myself most of the time because I don't know like I, I was always very cautious throughout this pregnancy and I don't know why I think it's just like you know you hear all those stories and you get very cautious and um, so yeah I went through pregnancy it was great i like had a little bit of morning sickness at night <laughs> in my first trimester but like second trimester was fine third trimester was fine i was just really really tired and um third trimester like i'm small i am a small petite woman so this baby was taking it out of me i was going to the toilet like three or four times a night so i was done i was like telling everybody like you know i don't care when this baby is born, I just like it to be born now because I'm tired. <laughs> and so, just a little bit about the pregnancy like history. I went to, because it's a pandemic, right? So I went to like four different doctors. So I went to the clinic Kesehatan, which is like the local clinic. And it would, and there were doctors there no problem i had my gynecologist like my family's gynecologist that i went to no problem and then i went to the gynecologist in the hospital that i wanted to give birth at so i saw her most often and she like no problem she even had me do like a really in-depth ultrasound and nothing like i was on that table for like 45 minutes and everything was good and then yeah, and uh, like the local clinic even um, referred me to specialists in like one of the bigger hospitals here and they said everything was fine. So throughout 
I went to four different doctors. I went to like two different hospitals, so many different clinics. And each time I went thinking like, oh no, oh no, what's happening? And when I got there, it was fine. Everything's good. So, um, yeah. And then <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the heart part. This is crap. But never mind. So, pregnancy, great. Fine. Dandy. Actually, compared to a lot of women, I had a great pregnancy. Like, compared to a lot of people, I had a great pregnancy. It was, it was more than great. It was fun. You know, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed my body. I really enjoyed gaining weight. I really enjoyed all of it. And then, so, on the 11th of July, the whole day, I had felt like, this feels like contractions. But I wasn't sure. So, in the morning, when I woke up, there was like, TMI, maybe, but I, they like, you know, they tell you about the mucus plug and everything, so I thought that I had the mucus, my mucus plug had come out of me, I don't know how to say, had like, gluala, and then I texted my doctor, my doctor said, yeah, don't worry about it, just come in, like, go into the hospital when your contractions are more, um, like, more frequent and closer together so I was like okay so I didn't really think much about it but the whole day I was feeling it so I was going up going about my day and I was working up until that point so I was writing for a TV show and up until that point I was writing and then dinner time I realized that like okay it's getting a little bit harder for me to eat so I started so I figured like okay lah you know what um I'm gonna just text to my doctor and my doctor said yeah you can go in for a check so I said okay so I tell my husband and at that time I was at my parents house and my sister my younger sister and her husband was there as well so they were like okay let's go so I packed all my stuff like I had already like a little hospital bag packed but I was just packing all the like overnight stuff and everything and I got this hospital I'm so I packed all our stuff and uh, we head over and like my contractions weren't that bad at that point but I could feel them I just I have a very high tolerance of pain so when I was in pain I realized we didn't put in the baby seat yet and I wanted to make sure the baby car seat was in because I wouldn't bring the baby home without it um, so we go downstairs and I see the car seat there. I'm like, we're putting the car seat in first. And they're like, shouldn't we just do that at the hospital while you're getting in? And I was like, no, no, do it here, do it here. So we all did it. Like I was doing it like fully pregnant, fully having contractions. And it was at a point where like my stomach was getting harder also. So I was like, oh, okay, these are real contractions. So we get to the hospital and I tell them like, I'm going to give birth. They're like, okay, cool. So they give me a, put me in a wheelchair and they bring me up to the, um, <coughs> To the delivery ward and there my husband uh, had to go down to do a COVID test they did a COVID test on me both negative cool so they moved us to our like delivery suite so my doctor had asked me like do you want to go home first because you're not um, dilated enough like I think at that point I was only like one centimeter dilated and this was 10 p.m. and I was telling her like I'm not sure because this is my first baby I have I, what do I know? But I texted my uh, my family. So my elder sister, who's had four children, one cesarean twins, and then two um, vaginal births. So she was the one who said that like better stay because our family tends to have, like from her experience, she didn't she didn't wait that long for her babies to be born. So I was like, okay, I think then I'll just stay and like. My house is really close to the hospital as well, so I was like, so there's no difference, it's just me getting in our car, so like, I'll just stay. So we stayed at the hospital, and then the contractions start getting pretty bad, like I'm already like on all fours, like breathing, I'm already like swinging, holding my belly, swinging, and then <laughs> the nurse is like, okay, so you're gonna stay, we'll move you to the room, um, can you walk? And I was like, I can walk right now, let's go. <laughs> like, I'm in between contractions. So we go there, and then she was like, 
do you want to like take one of those jabs in the in your butt to help with the pain and I said yeah sure it's because this whole time like and my doctor was well aware of it is that like I was a little afraid to take an epidural but it wasn't like a natural whatever it's just like I'm I deal with I have like an anxiety disorder and one of my triggers is medication that I don't know enough about so I was always a bit afraid of an epidural and so she was like okay let me just jab you in the butt and then you can sleep so that like when you have to give birth you'll have enough energy so it's like okay but I did not go to sleep so up until like I think I was able to like be in and out of sleep for like half an hour but every time the contractions came back I would wake up so like my husband would help by rubbing my back and like I told him to just like rub my head so that my brain could focus on a different part of my body and that helped and um yeah so I don't know like I think about 5 a.m or like 4 30 like that um my contractions were so bad like it was really bad like I was lying on my back and then I just threw myself off the bed and I just stood up and I looked down and there was blood on the floor and just as I see the blood on the floor my body makes the <sighs> like they tell you you it's natural for you to push but they don't tell you how natural it is so when I felt that I immediately like screamed and my husband like called the nurse then he's like what why he was like call the nurse like there's blood he's like what I'm like call the nurse so he called the nurse then I tell her like I feel like pushing so she's like okay like let me check you so she checks me and I'm eight centimeters dilated and she's like wow good job i'm like oh thank you i didn't do anything but thank thank god because <laughs> i was afraid that like if those contractions were so bad at that point that i might need an epidural but then when she said eight centimeters i was like oh okay like seven or eight centimeters i was like oh cool so um uh then like we just wait until my doctor gets there they put me on gas and air I'm talking to my husband about like an anime he's watching and then you know the nurses were so kind so sweet they were like rubbing my legs rubbing my back my husband was rubbing my hands and the gas and that my goodness did that help because that was all I needed because at one point you know they tell you you've heard the stories of women going like it felt like I was being run over by a truck and you think like what is that feeling until you go wow it feels like you've been run over by a truck because I literally had to look down to see if my legs were still attached to me because it really felt like they had gone whoop off me <laughs> but okay lah um, then my doctor arrives and love my doctor if she ever gives me permission I'll share her name but uh, she comes in and she's like alright Alicia uh, she breaks my water and she's like now you can push whenever you want to because before that I was like already feeling like I needed to push but I was so I was pushing but just not very hard so uh, she broke my water and she was like okay now you can just push whenever you want to don't worry about it I was like okay cool because that was that was my end goal <laughs> so I started pushing and I did it I pushed my baby out in 15 minutes about 15 minutes so by that point it was 5 47 and <laughs> my baby was born at 5 47 p.m and you know they did the thing when they put her on my chest and i was looking at her and my baby um adia that's her name <laughs> uh, adia came out screaming bloody murder she was just like oh the whole i felt like it was reverberating yeah screaming i just came out screaming bloody murder like so loud i felt like the whole room was reverberating with her screams it was so it was just so powerful. I don't know how to explain it, but it was so dynamic. And then she got on my chest and she was still crying. And I was just trying to talk to her, you know, everybody like would say Assalamualaikum. And I was just, because I was so in shock, I think like part of me was like forgot that I had just given birth to someone. Part of me forgot that I was like nine months pregnant. 
So when I pushed her out and they put her on my chest and I saw her, all I could think about was like, oh my God, this baby, this my baby. And I was just staring at her and I was just saying like, oh, hello, hi, hi. And they were wiping her. And then they took her away to like do the usual stuff and they asked my husband if he wanted to azan into her ear, like do the call to prayer in her ear. And he was like, yeah, sure, let's do it. So he holds her and I can see them over there while I'm getting stitched up. So I can see them over there and I can see them. And he's just holding her and he's doing the whole call to prayer. And then he walks up next to me while I'm still lying down and he's like, Sha, look. Sha, it's a baby, it's our baby. I'm like, yeah. And he was just saying, like, he was just showing her to me. Then he was like, do you want to hold her? I was like, no, I'm like actually really tired. <laughs> like, it's okay, you hold her sekejap, like, for a while. And then he was like, okay. So he held her. And then he put her down back in the baby cot that is, like, available there. And he came back to check on me. So when he came back to check on me, I was just talking to my doctor, like, about what was happening to me down there and thank god I only needed two stitches it was great um, then I was talking to Ali like because he was like texting people he had taken videos so he was like updating people right and then suddenly I realised that she was crying this whole time like so the only time she did not cry was when her father held her and was singing the call to prayer into her ear and then when he put her down again she started crying again and this time like what I realized was that her crying got like her, she was crying the whole time, and then suddenly she was like as like suddenly the sound of her crying wasn't there. So I was like a little um, confused. So I asked my doctor, like, "Where's my baby?" And is that not like the most cliche thing ever? Like they always do that in the movies <laughs> and in the TV shows where the mother asks, where's my baby? And that was my question, right? Because I heard, and this is something I found out later, but the NICU is on the same floor as the delivery ward. And I had heard her cry all the way out of the room into the hallway and it just stopped because she had gone into the NICU. And so she, so I asked my doctor, my doctor was very like calm about it, she was like, you know, focusing on me, so she was like, don't worry, um, like, don't worry, like, I'll ask the nurses, and then she asked the nurse, and one of the nurses said, like, oh, the baby was turning blue, so we wanted to just make sure everything was okay. So already I'm like, what does that mean? Like, I'm looking at my doctor, and my doctor's looking at me reassuring me and saying, like, don't worry about it. Like, I'll go myself, and I'll check on the baby after this. Like, let's just get you all together so you can rest. Then I was like, okay. And, you know, it's like, I trusted my doctor. And um, at that point, like, even if I wanted to do anything, I like, couldn't really get up and walk over. So they told me to... So they cleaned me up and everything and because this is my first baby, I didn't really know what to expect. Like, do they sleep in the same room? Do they go into the NICU for checkups and all that? So I was like, okay. Um, so the nurse was like, you can sleep here for another couple of hours Then tomorrow morning like at 8am. It was like already 5.47 so they said like about 8 or 9, we'll move you up to the room, your room in the ward upstairs. So I was like, in the maternity ward. That's the word. So we'll move you to the maternity ward upstairs. So I was like, okay. So I wake up later and like a really sweet nurse comes in and she's like, Do you want do you think you need to pee? And I was like, maybe. So I go and I pee, everything's fine. And then I ask her, like, do you know where my baby is? Like, is there like where's my baby? And the nurse was like, Oh, um, I'm not really sure because I'm just here for you but I can ask, I was like, it, it's okay. Then she was saying like, yeah, it's okay. Like you go up to the ward and you can ask the nurses up there, they'll probably know better. And I was like, okay. So wake my husband up. At this point, I had slept, not much. I really didn't sleep that much because after giving birth and everything, like, at that, I think I slept like half an hour. So I went, so they put me in a wheelchair, they bring me upstairs. And as I'm being wheeled to the lift, I see the NICU. And I know that my baby's in there, but I can't do much about it because they kept saying like the doctors will call you, the doctors will call you. So 
so okay <laughs> we go upstairs we go into the maternity ward and we're just there waiting and my husband's already slowly freaking out because he's like why aren't they telling us anything why aren't they saying anything why didn't they call us nothing blah, blah, blah. and then finally i think it was like after lunch yeah so before all that <laughs> Uh, once we got to the room, I asked my younger sister, I texted my younger sister because everybody was already starting to be like, oh, congratulations, like, yay, so excited. And I was starting to freak out because I didn't really know what to say to people. Like, um, So I texted my younger sister and I was like, hey, can you come over? Because Ali's freaking out, I'm freaking out. Um, and I think we just need like somebody like a buffer like i think you need to come here to take care of me so ali can you know f take care of dia and like himself and then my sister really quickly was like yeah i'm on the way and she showed up like half an hour later and then when she showed up we got the call from the doctors to go down to the NICU so we went down to the NICU i was in my <laughs> i was just like you know you just gave birth what are you doing so I get into the wheelchair and I go downstairs and they are... And it's really... It's really sad. I think this is the part where like... It got really sad because we wait... Because like the NICU is such that there's one door that you enter and then there's another door that you have to wait until they unlock. So we went into the first door and then it's just like a little cubicle and you have to ring and then you're just waiting there. So I could feel that like my husband was really anxious, but I was, I was optimistic. I felt like I've heard enough stories about people who've had babies in the NICU and like how they come out after a few days or like you know like the babies are okay. So I just thought it was one of those things, and then we, the nurse finally opens the door and they're like, uh, yeah, come in, come in. But it was really like you could tell the energy was weird because they were like come in come in and it wasn't like come in this is your baby it was come in come in here you need to go this way and there were a couple of doctors there and um my doctor was there and so she was the one who was referring to me the most at that point and she was like we're gonna talk in this room okay and that's when i got very unsure like why are we talking in the room so okay never mind we go into the room we go into the room and um they basically had the on-call NICU doctor tell us that um, when she arrived, like when Adia arrived to the NICU, her oxygen levels were really low and they weren't really sure why. So they checked on her and at that point, they were just thinking sepsis and sepsis is something that happens when the mom's sick. So my doctor was asking me like, were you sick at any point? And I was like, no, like, honestly, nine months with her, I was not sick once, like once. I haven't been sick, like she, I don't know what she is, but I wasn't sick. So my doctor was like, okay, because we're not really sure how she could be septic if you weren't sick. So I was like, I don't know. And then they were like, then they asked like, your COVID test, it was negative, right? I was like, yes, it was negative. So my doctor asked me, like, is it okay if I order another COVID test for you? Because we need to make sure that you are not um, COVID positive so that we know better how to treat your daughter. And I was like, um, sure, okay. <laughs> like, of course, like, I wasn't going to say no, right? And then they got one of the specialists or like the specialist at this hospital she's a neonatal specialist so she came in and she was explaining like just how bad it was and it was like insane to me to hear all of that at that point because I think it's like I wasn't I didn't sleep so I didn't understand most of it and I wasn't sure how to feel because it was just like okay she's sick and the doctor like actually looked at me and she said like I need you to understand like, I need you to, under, to really understand this. Your baby is very, very sick. And I think that's what broke me. So I just started tearing up. And they were all really sweet. Like, they just ran to get me tissues. And 
Yeah, like so they asked like me and Ali, do you want to go see her? So Ali was like, yeah, let's go see her. But I was at that point so exhausted, and I was just so heartbroken, and I was so anxious because, like, I get really anxious when I don't get enough sleep. So it's like, um, <coughs> I don't think I, I don't think I like I can go in there. Because also, I thought like, okay, let's go in, like, just roll me in, and like, you know, if anything happens, like, I faint or whatever, just roll me out, that's fine, but then they tell us like, oh, you can't go into the room with your wheelchair, so I'm like, okay, cool, I can't walk, <laughs> I just gave birth, I didn't sleep up until that point, I haven't slept yet, so they, but they were more than understanding, you know, they weren't judgy or whatever, they were more than understanding, they were like, yeah, you go rest, and then you can come and see her whenever you want to, and the doctors were always really sweet, they were like, you can call the NICU if you want any updates, you can call us if you want any updates, like, don't worry about it, and I know this is not protocol, but like, the doctors were so sweet, like, take my number, and we were like, okay, so we go back upstairs, and because I was an idiot, and because I was so tired, so we go upstairs, I do the COVID test, and the, the nurse is like, okay, so you can't leave this room until we, uh, until we get the results back. And I was like, oh, okay, so when do the results come back? They're like, yeah, tomorrow morning. So I was like, tomorrow morning? And that's when it hit me, like, I won't be able to see my baby <laughs> until tomorrow morning. So my brain was like, I'll go upstairs, I'll take a nap, I'll come back down when I've had a bit more energy to walk in. But no, I had to wait until the next morning. So we wait, um, you know, my younger sister leaves and then we have to, and then we just sit there like waiting, like, so it, that was like a pretty normal day because to us it's like just waiting, at that point it was just waiting for her to get antibiotics, enough antibiotics so that the sepsis will go away, because that's what we thought. And then um, the next morning, we were like, so the a nurse comes in at like 6.37 to take my temperature and I'm just, and the first thing is like, can I see my baby? And then they're like, oh, you have to wait for your results. And I was like, okay, so when yeah, are my results back? Yeah, she was like, let me check. So I was like, okay. And yeah, and best part is my husband was due to get his second dose of the COVID vaccine that day. So he was supposed to like, after we see the baby, for him to go off and come back. So then the nurse, the nurse like comes back like 30 minutes later and she's like, okay, got the results back, you're negative. I shot out of that bed and I was like, I, I screamed at my husband like, get up, we can go now. So he was, oh no, because he was in the toilet, so I was screaming like, hey, we can go. Then he's like, okay, okay, so he's like, bathes and he's like, do you want to be on? Like, nah, later, later. So, okay, he, we go down and we see her. <laughs> And I don't, like, you know, so many things happened in such a short amount of time that like, I'm trying to be able to speak about it, at the same time trying to remember it, and at the same time trying to, like, hold all the emotions in. It's a lot. So, um, the, we go in, but they stop us, I think. If I remember correctly, that was the day the nurses, like, came, um, can we? Can you wait out here for a second? Like the doctors are still doing a procedure. We'll call you when we're ready. So I said, okay. Um, okay. Not really much I could do at that point. So we wait. And then my, um, and then they finally let us in, and the doctor. The doctor calls us into the room again, and I hate, I hate that tiny little room now. Like if I ever go back to the hospital, I look at that tiny little room and I go like, but never mind. So I see the tiny little room and we go in, and the doctor is showing me her blood test results. Well, she's showing us the blood test results, and she's like, there's something really weird with her liver. So if this is sepsis, it's sometimes like it will attack the organs but it doesn't usually attack one single organ it attacks all the organs and we saw that it was attacking her liver and one of her liver functions was very very high like it's supposed to be in the double digits but it was in 10,000 it was like it was really high and then she 
was trying to explain to us like this is very bad like i've never seen this in a living baby so me and my husband like what can you say to that we don't this is our first kid we've never heard of this before so we're just like nodding our heads looking at her and she was like she's she's a ball buster so she was looking at me like and my husband like i need you guys to like tell me that you understand what's going on because I need you to tell me, like, I need us to be on the same page. And my husband just looked at her and was like, you're trying to tell us that she should be dead, lah. And, our, and the doctor was just like, yes. And I'm not sure what's going on. So, we have no idea what's going on, but she said, like, she's going to try and figure it out. Like, so what we're doing now, what her, she's doing now is, like, trying to figure it out. She's going to call a bunch of people and bless her like every time we saw her she was on the phone talking to someone so we look at the so finally they say like do you want to see your baby i'm like yes so i go see my baby <laughs> stupid <laughs> yeah so uh i go see my baby crazy is like because I see her and I know she's my baby so she's got curly hair and <laughs> she's a feisty little thing and the doctor was like you look at her she's been fighting the tube that was in her <laughs> she was intubated because her oxygen levels were so low and the doctor was like she's been fighting the tube she's figured it out that like if she pulls this way the tube comes out and she, she had, at that point she had already pulled it out like once or twice apparently and I was like very proud of her. I was like, good job, good job baby. And I was looking at her like, oh my god she's so small. <laughs> and she was so white, like so white, like I don't know why that like stuck out to me. Like she was just so, she looked like me. <laughs> she had my skin tone and she had my hair. And I was just looking at her and she was this little thing and she had like, big eyes and she was looking at me like hey and it was so weird like I started talking and you could see her look for me and I was just like oh this kid's cool this, <laughs> she's a really cool kid and she yeah so we were watching her and just like hanging out and talking to her and you could literally see her like because the tube was in her mouth you could see her go like and she's it was almost like as if she didn't she didn't think we could see her, so she's like, mm -hmm. I'm doing something they don't know. But obviously, we were like, stop doing that. Um, and then we were just hanging out with her, and we were talking to her. And then, I think we went back up because my other sister came to give me food, like confining food. So we went back up, and I obviously break down when I get into the room. And they're like, why, what happened, what happened? And... Yeah, I missed it. <laughs> I missed it a little bit. But basically, my sister came up and I was just like really upset that like, you know, it was like she's got sepsis, I'm scared and everything. And my sister said something to me that made me feel better. And she was like, you know, if it is sepsis, just think about it like this. Sepsis, all you need is antibiotics and you get better. Like, that's all she needs is antibiotics and she gets better. And, and she kept saying, at least they know what it is. And I was like, I don't think they know, but I didn't say that. So that's after that, we went back down and they told us about her liver. And then they were also telling us that they just didn't know what was happening. So when we went back up, I broke down. And I was just like, they, they don't know. They don't know anything. They don't know what's happening. Like her liver function is too high. At this point, I had to be lifted off the wheelchair and onto the bed. And it's just like, I think I'm crying just because having to remember all these things again is insane. And I'm by myself and I'm just crying to myself, you know. It's fine. Yeah, whatever. So, um, they put me back in bed. 
it and they're like why why what do you know and everything and i was like i don't know anything <laughs> the doctors don't know anything i don't know anything so okay so finally my um my sister you know they just they tried their best to like make us feel better my husband was already like reeling and then um i think later that day we get a call to go back downstairs this is the second day yeah we get a call to go back downstairs and um they tell us that she started to bleed out of some of her tubes so she had like a feeding tube into the stomach and then she had a tube um the intubation so she had a tube into her lungs and she had one like that went into her bladder and she had like a line for like the needle that would give her her antibiotics um and they said that some of her tubes like she was bleeding out of some of them and they checked and like her platelet levels were really low and if you don't know the platelets that's our that's what helps our blood clot and her clotting factors were really low and it was starting to affect her other organs and we just <laughs> I think I, I don't remember knowing anything at that point I don't remember thinking anything at that point I don't think we I don't think I had thoughts in my head at that point so they said like they're not sure what's happening so okay at this point we think like um I guess we don't really know what we can do for her and we don't really know what's going to happen next so we just hang out with her until like 2 in the morning and we're like begging for her because at this point it had affected her kidneys so she wasn't peeing as much and so we were just begging her like please pee, please pee, see if anything just pee like it'll really help and then the next day, so we go upstairs, we sleep, and I, I can't believe, like, I'm so proud of myself, like, whatever it is, I'm proud that, like, I managed to sleep, obviously not a lot, but, you know, I would be awake until, like, 3 or 4 in the morning, and I'll sleep and wake up at, like, 7, so at least I got some sleep, because it helped me stay safe, if anything, like, that was, that was good for me, and then, um, so, the next day, we wake up because the doctor has called my husband and they said like you have to go downstairs to the NICU yeah they called the room like the doctor wants to see you in the NICU so we go downstairs and it's like it's been every day like that like we don't we get a call and we're like ah. like it always felt like the good like it was like okay it's not great news but it's good news in the day and then in the, at night or in the evening it was just like yeah all of that is out the window so okay we go down and the doctor's like i have good news but it's it's not great we were like okay <laughs> okay and she says i think i figured out what happened here it's called neonatal hemochromatosis that's the good news the bad news is 10 to 20 percent of cases survive And I think at that point, I was just like, good, at least we know what it is, at least we can say something, like, at least uh, we can figure out what's happening. And I asked, like, how can this happen? And they said, like, well, sometimes it just happens, it's something that is, they're not sure if it's genetic or not. And they were like, we have to do, like, so there are different ways to make sure that it is neonatal hemochromatosis, but it's like, or either like they take a piece of her in a lip or they operate and do a, a liver biopsy to make sure but at that point she was pretty weak so they didn't know what else to do so she says like okay there's this thing that you can do to help them it's like one is like immunoglobulin um, like an injection I forgot what it is like when they put it through the body um, so 
immunoglobulin and the other thing is called renal placement so it's basically like dialysis but for a baby and if you don't know dialysis is usually a needle into your arm or your leg but when it's a baby they have to I don't even remember what they explained but basically with Adia because her kidneys were already so bad they needed to go into her heart um, yeah. so the procedure would be that the needle would go from her neck and it would hit here and go straight into her heart one of her upper chambers and when I heard that I was like what? you just what? excuse me? This person, what? This person has been on earth for like less than a week and this, that's what's happening right now? Okay. So, we're like, um, can we talk about it? Like, because it, at this point, like, she's really sick. So, they're saying, if we don't do it soon, she has about a week. That's insane to me. Like, she had about a week. So, the doctor said, can you make a decision? So, but she then said, like, you need to pay, like, a lot of money. And because we weren't in a government hospital, she said, if you get into a government hospital, it's so much cheaper. You, and, But at that point, the cases in Malaysia were hitting 20,000. So she was saying, like, we probably won't get in because a lot of hospitals are now COVID hospitals and they're not accepting any non-COVID cases and I was just like what is, what is this reality? I just it felt like I was in a TV show it felt like I was in a really really messed up video game so we call our dads my, uh, like my dad and my father-in-law comes in like my husband calls them in and he's talking to them and he, at this point, he, my husband, not once did my husband falter. He really, like, believed that this would save her. But I think at that point, I was just so tired. Man, they couldn't tell us if it would be a good thing or a bad thing. And we didn't know because, like, it's a lot of money. And that was just the first step. What if she needs another 10 steps and each step is just as expensive, if not more? I was so worried, like, where are we going to get the money? What, how are we going to do any of this? You know? And my husband was like, let's talk to our dads. So we talked to our dads. And my dad is Mr. Give her a chance lah. No, it's fine, give her a chance. I think you just give her a chance. And my dad's always like, if you never try, you never know. Like, ever since I was a kid, he's always been that person. And then, so I think they came together and they made the decision like okay we're gonna do it and then the next so the procedure was gonna be for the next day so that happened and we were like okay lah because I felt like you I told my husband like you make the decision because you know I trust you and I don't think I'm in the right mindset right now so you make the decision so he was like okay and then <sighs> and then at night my father-in-law came and he thought like he met with my husband and he talked to my husband and he was basically telling my husband like I think this might not be such a good idea if we do the renal placement because we don't know what will happen after we don't know what would be her quality of life like you know it's a lot of money and you know you, you're so young And it's just like, we don't really know what her quality of life would be like. And I understand that because we had nothing to go off of. This is so rare that like, if you hear of people who their cases, it's the ones who have passed away, the ones who didn't make it. And if you didn't hear of them, they, like if they survived, they were even rarer. So where do you find them? You know, so we were like, we just, it just, didn't look positive, it didn't look good to us at that point. So my husband was like, okay, so he came, he comes back up into our room, he texts the doctor, the specialist that we're not going to do it. And then he sits down next to me in the bed and we just cry. Yeah, we just cry. We're just crying, like, because 
we have to say goodbye to her. And then we go downstairs. Uh, to the NICU and we like we hang and we were saying uh, like we'll hang out with her and like if, if anything happens to her I'm always gonna write stories about her and my husband was like yeah I'm always gonna write songs for her and we're always gonna like make music for her and I was like okay cool so we went down and we were basically talking to her and I called two of my best friends because I really wanted them to meet her and I just introduced them to her and they were talking to her and we were talking to her and at this point she was on a lot of morphine because she was bleeding a lot so they they wanted um, so she was in a way but we were talking to her and we were singing to her and at this point because of her kidneys she was like she was swelling because of all the water retention. So it was a rough night, lah. <laughs> it was a really rough night, but it was so beautiful. Like I don't know how to explain it. It's like it really felt like we were in our own little bubble of time, of space, matter, love. It was like we were one single molecule, you know, like the three of us doesn't make sense but it felt like that um, and then we go back upstairs and my husband who has been running around the hospital the whole day because you know I can't do that so he has to run around the hospital to answer a bunch of things and everything and he says like he goes to sleep and that was the night that I stayed up until 5 in the morning five or six in the morning, I don't remember, but I remember it just like, the time passed by so fast, and all I did, all I did before I went to sleep, because I kept telling myself, just go to sleep, just go to sleep, you know, but I really didn't want to go to sleep, because that meant that like, the next day, something might happen to her, and all the timeline kept getting shorter and shorter, so they would tell us like, you have two weeks, you have one week, and like, now you have a couple of days. So I think I just didn't want to waste any time being asleep. So I, but I knew that I needed to sleep because if not I would go crazy. So I, I sit in my bed and I'm crying, and I'm crying, and that's like when I just start to beg, I start to plead, God, I start to beg, my like, please, 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 like anything. Anything to save my daughter, please. <laughs> I didn't bring tissues into this room, damn it. So I said, like, anything, anything, please, please, anything to save my daughter, please. <laughs> you know, and I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm doing all the prayer that I can do. You can't pray, right? <laughs> so I was just like reading all the prayers that I knew, like reciting all the verses I knew, and I was just like, please, anything, anything, please. Because I don't know what I would do. I don't know what I would do if I lost her. Because this was the night I thought I would lose her forever. <laughs> so <laughs> then the next day, we wake up. Like my husband wakes me up because the doctor has called him, and this time the doctor called him. Uh, can write me and she was like can you come downstairs because there's a visiting doctor from another from another hospital a government hospital who wants to talk to you guys and she was the one who told our specialist about the neonatal hematomatosis 
So he was like, she really wants to talk to us. And, I was, and at that point, I had I was so angry and so tired. I was like, why? Why do they want to keep talking to us when there's always this bad news? Like, you just want to tell us that. You just want to keep telling us, like, our baby's not going to survive. Or, like, our baby's not going to do very well. And they, but we were like, okay, fine. We went downstairs. And at this point, because they put us, they let us sit down. They always, they were always so sweet at this hospital. They let us sit down and they always give us space. So this time, like, I was just sitting there, just staring at her. I was, part of me was even afraid to touch her, because I just didn't know what any of it meant. And I was so scared. I was so scared. And I think people don't realize, like, that's how scary. Like, just how scary it is. Huh? But everybody was really kind, and the doctor came and asked me, like, so, how are you feeling? And I looked at her, and I was like, I'm kind of checked out. <laughs> the doctor was like, yeah, that happened. And I, I, was, I took that, like, that, like, I really appreciated that, because at least then, like, at least I understood, like, my reactions are completely normal, they're completely fair. So, okay. So, she's like, okay, so this doctor's gonna come by, you know, uh, then we're gonna... We're gonna talk to her. I was like, what, what she gonna tell us? And she said like, she wants to talk to us about the renal placement. And then, and it was like we already made the decision that we weren't gonna do it, right? But then the doctor really wanted to talk to us. And in hindsight, like, bless her. She's a real angel, you know. Like, that's when I. You realise lah, like I was begging God, I was pleading for something, anything. And he he gave us this doctor. Like it's insane, like I'm so grateful, but it's just like if if you had to say these words, wouldn't it be so weird? But I'm I'm so grateful. I just can't believe that was my life. <laughs> um but yeah, this doctor. So she comes in and she's this really sweet lady and she's like but the first thing that comes out of her mouth is I want you to know that my purpose in life is to save babies and I think that was what snapped me back to reality I was like what did you just say like this person literally saves babies like what are you this is uh, so cool that was like a really cool line you know so we started listening to her and suddenly it was like almost with every sentence she said like my world started to open up again because with every before this like every day it was closing in on me and then like us like it was closing in on us me and my husband but me especially because my husband like i said did not falter you know so she was talking about like oh so you know your daughter's brain activity is fine even though there's a little bit of seizures So the doctor will show you my husband like oh okay so you see her brain activity is fine uh the brain looks good there's not that much bleeding so dia has had a couple of seizures at that point because like her low platelets were making all her organs bleed out so part in part like her brain but gratefully thank god her brain was never the worst part because that was always what they said like if her brain goes that's when this whole thing ends so she was showing, and then she was showing my husband like through ultrasound, like on the chest, like on the heart, like this is where the needle would go in and everything. And I swear to God, is I don't know what it was, but I was just when she was doing that, I really all I did was just stare out a window, and I just kept thinking about the COVID numbers. I remember this so clearly because I was thinking about the numbers being so high and that making it impossible for us to find a government hospital and that means that like my baby doesn't get a chance because it's so expensive and I just kept thinking like do you know how many people go through this like I was just like that that's a lot of people's babies there's a lot of people losing family because of COVID like not just people who lose families to COVID 
and then you have people who lose families because the hospitals are busy with COVID, and it's like it's insane. It's so it was so heartbreaking. It was so upsetting, you know. So then the doctor sat down and she started talking to us, and she was saying, and I'm so sorry about the knocking, but. I don't really think I'm going to be recording this more than once. <laughs> um, so she started saying, like, you know, I have actually, um, I've actually taken care of cases like this before, and like, out of five in her whole career, five cases, two of them survived, two or three, I think. So I was like, what? Because I went to that point, we didn't hear of anybody actually surviving. So when she said that, my brain just went, what? They can survive? And we asked, like, because we were so worried about her quality of life, so we asked, like, what was their quality of life? And she was like, oh, so far, like, one of them I know, that I've seen recently is about five years old. Okay, no, like, you know, for lack of a better word, normal, like, normal baby. I was like, even more, my brain was like, what? Like, because this is something like even my doctor, my specialist, the like dear specialist at this hospital, they had never heard of this. They they were like, this is something we read in books in school, but it's not something you see in real life. And so they didn't know what to tell us. And bless them, they weren't telling us like false positives, you know, or like false. They weren't giving us false hope. So, <coughs> so yeah, then. I say, <laughs> so, yeah, and then I, like she tells us all these great things, and she's like, it's worth it, and I'm like, okay, but I have one question. She's like, what? And I was, just looked at her and said, like, your intention here is to save our baby's life, right? And she looked at me and she's like, yes, and that's all I wanted, because you know you get scared like people use your baby for like. Like, I don't know, like, for experiments or whatever, but, I don't know, I was really tired at that point, so I don't even remember what I was thinking half the time. So, after that, we get up, and I swear, it was like, a new energy came into us, and we walked over to Dia, and we were like, do we do it? Like, me and my husband were just staring at each other, like, do we do it? Do we not do it? Like, Dia, give us a sign, can you say something? Do you want to do it? I kept asking her, like, you not good, like, do you want, like, do you want us to do it, like, it sounds like a lot for you to handle, and then one of the nurses there, and she was such a sweetheart, one of the NICU nurses overheard me, and she's like, she can do it, mommy, she's strong, she can do it, mommy, like, she's strong, this one, this little girl, like, this one very strong, mommy, and that gave us a lot of hope, that gave us a lot of because I've never seen babies in the NICU. I don't know what to base anything off of. But the fact that this kaka was saying like, that she's strong and that she can do it made me feel like, yeah, made me feel very proud. <laughs> it made me feel very optimistic. So we go off and then suddenly it becomes like this whole family meeting. I'm talking to my father, I'm talking to my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my mom. And you know, I kept asking my mom, like, is this okay? Is it okay that I'm doing this? Like, is it selfish that I want my daughter to stick around? Like, is it selfish? You know, that like, she's in so much pain, but I want her to stick around. And my mom was like, it's not selfish. It's, it's not selfish because you want the best for your daughter. You know, and even if it is selfish, and I realized then, I was like, okay, cool, you know? And my dad also, like, he just kept telling me, like, she just, all she needs is a chance, you know? She's already fighting her very best, and you can see that she's fighting. She just needs a chance, just give her that chance. So, okay, lah, straight away, my husband was like, okay, I'm going to text them and we'll go through with it, we'll do this thing. And then, of course, we go down and we tell the doctor and then the specialist is like, yes, but I have to repeat to you because this this is their job. Like, I have, the doctor's like, I have to repeat to you that this is a high-risk case and she might 
die and I was just like, oh god of course I forgot about that like, because we got so excited that this might save her that I completely forgot about that caveat so so we we say yeah and they start get prepping her and everything and she's asleep this whole time but she's so brave such a brave little girl like the bravest little person I know lah and then they give me a form and like it says high risk on it and then the doctor has to tell me what might happen so because her platelets were so low she might bleed out I'm like okay and because the needle was being um it directly inserted into her heart she might go into cardiac arrest so her heart might stop and I was like okay <laughs> but what so like and then I have to sign the paper because I'm the mom so I look at her and I go like there's no other way for her kidneys to like just suddenly be okay right and she's like no the kidneys have failed and I was like, until this point they were like the kidneys are bad the kidneys they're not doing so well this one is like kidneys have failed so of course I'm like right like I'm just gonna sign it and then me and my husband like it was almost like we knew what was happening like we did not we just did not stick around the NICU we couldn't handle it so my parents and his parents they sat outside the NICU waiting for the news me and him we were like bye we need to go for a walk we need to do something my husband was like I'm gonna go pray I was like okay I need coffee and I swear to God, I have I cried all over that hospital that day because it was the scariest. It was the longest half an hour of my life. It was so scary. And then we, so I'm like crying in the lift, going down. Like people are going, people are going for like appointments, you know. Like some some people are going for the flu, and I'm crying like that. And then I go, and then like as I'm walking, I'm telling my sister, it's like, can you imagine that? I can't imagine my life without her. Like the whole point was to have her here, and like, can you imagine? I'm twenty eight. I'm twenty eight. I'm too young. I'm too young to have my baby leave me like this. And then now I feel like myself. I would be too young at any age. You know, like I'll be ninety years old, and if she passes away before me, I'm like, no, no, no. I'm too young. You cannot. You can't just up and leave me like this. That was not the agreement. No. So then, my, like. Through tears, I'm like saying all these things. Then my sister was like, Do you want coffee? And like, through tears, I'm like, Yeah, an Americano. So she gets, so I like cry outside of Starbucks. Cry all the way out. Then we go outside, like, cause fresh air. And we just sit there and I'm just crying. And then my husband comes out and he's just crying. And we're all just crying. And then finally we go upstairs. Uh, so my husband goes upstairs first because he's like, I'm gonna go pray and I'll meet you in front of the NICU. So I was like, Okay. So we went upstairs. And as I'm walking towards the NICU, suddenly I see my husband, who is much bigger than me, absolutely body. Like he just walks up to me and he just envelops me. And I'm just like, what is he gonna say? Like, why why would you hold me like this? And then he just holds me and he's like, she's okay. She's okay. Like the, the needles inside, like they, got, they inserted the needle and she's okay. So they they're gonna let us in to see her in a while. <laughs> and I just I didn't even break down at that point. I was already crying the whole time. But I was just like, Oh thank God. <laughs> oh I kept saying it was just like, oh alhamdulillah. Oh alhamdulillah ya Allah and then <laughs> So I brought her. Brought her blood. So finally like we go in. And we see her lah, that it was all nicely bandaged. And we see her. And the little thing is quite an enigma. So, oh, I forgot to say this part. Like, I know I broke down and everything before, like while it was happening, but right after I signed the papers, I was so scared that. I don't know, I was just so scared. Like this whole time I just wanted to be able to hold her. And I had still up until that point never got to hold her after they put her on my chest. So I just asked her, like, while she was lying down getting ready for the procedure, I just and she was asleep. But I just asked her, like, yeah. You're gonna be okay, Kan, yeah, like it's okay, Kan. Like, are you 
forgot what I asked. Yeah, I think it was just that. Like, you're gonna be okay, can okay, baby? Like, you're okay, baby. I'm here now. I'll see you later, okay? I'll see you later. And I swear, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's like, because I'm a mom, so I'm biased as all hell. But I saw her little eyes go. Like, she blinked at me. It was almost like she said, don't worry about it, mom. I got this. <laughs> and I went out, broke down, cried and everything. But then, like, when I went to the room, I was like, you did have it. I was so proud of her. And like, it was almost immediate. Because once they started the machine, she, her kidneys started, um, she started urinating. So that was great. And at, up and until that point, we were staying in the hospital. So we were like, you know what? We can check out now because like i said we live only like my parents live only like five minutes from the hospital so we were like we can come back and see her so we went off we finally went home i went home without my baby yeah. and what's great is from my parents balcony i can see the hospital so i just sat down and i was just staring at the hospital and i was talking to her like yeah Mama's here, okay? Mark's here. Jangan risau. Like, I'm coming back, okay? And we went back to see her at like 10 or 12 and we stayed until 2 in the morning. It was just playing songs and singing to her and just like telling her stories. And then we came home and the next day, like, I woke up early to just, you know, because confinement, like, so in Malaysia we do this thing when in confinement you like bathe in herbs and oils and you get massaged and you do all kinds of things so I was supposed to do that but like halfway through suddenly my husband barges out of our bedroom and he's like they're gonna move her because the whole time this was happening they were trying to get her into a government hospital where the facilities are better they have all the specialists there and um, it's so much cheaper so they so he barged out and he's like they're gonna move her they want to move her and he was so upset and I was like what do you mean move her and he said like a government hospital had accepted her case and they were going to move her so that would mean that my little four day old baby four five day old baby would have to be moved in an ambulance with a giant needle sticking out of her neck so we were like what <laughs> So okay, my husband goes first to the hospital to check out and everything. And then I so soon, like, later on, I joined. And, and like, again, it, it really felt like, I don't know if it's, it felt like God, you know, because they said that they had gotten the call, like my, the specialist at this private hospital was saying, like, we got a call and from this government hospital and we already told them no because the procedure had started so we wanted her to get like we wanted it to go along first but then suddenly just after that call like 10-15 minutes later the machine clocks and if you don't know the dialysis machine like it needs like filters like bags of water and it's filters but like the machine was clogged so that means they needed to buy more filters and that would have taken them a couple of hours in which the like hours in which she would be able to be moved so my doctors were like immediately called back the government hospital and were like do you still have that space and they were like yes and they were like we're moving her to you guys and it worked out because this government hospital was only 10 minutes away because there was another government hospital we were talking to as well but they would have been like 20 30 minutes away and they were that one's in like the middle of the city centre with all the traffic so I was just not interested in that <laughs> or not that I wasn't interested, I was interested in anything same with my baby but like the fact that we got the hospital closer to us, it was even closer to our place so we could go and see her every day no problem because um, if you weren't, if I remember correctly we were still in lockdown like so there was still like roadblocks everywhere like police roadblocks everywhere and you needed like a good excuse to move around and like you needed proof of where you were going so yeah uh, that day we went and I signed another high risk form <laughs> where it said that I would be moving my daughter transferring my daughter from this government uh, from this private hospital to a government hospital uh, 
and then we did it. My husband went into the ambulance with her, and her specialist went in with her, and two NICU nurses went with her, and I, I was in another car with my younger sister, who drove me, and then we went to the government hospital, and it felt like that was a whole journey on its own. It, you know, like I'm so sorry. This is already an hour long, but that's not even half. Well, that's basically half of the story. Yeah.